If there's one thing no one expects from a plane, it's for it to simply fall into a dive and plummet into the ground nose first. It's an almost impossible to imagine scenario that would bring about many questions for those investigating such an incident. On January 8th, 2016, such an accident took place in Northern Europe. The pilots of a cargo plane struggled to understand what was happening to their plane. Before they could recover their stricken aircraft and make sense of their situation, the aircraft and themselves crashed into a mountainous region of Sweden. The recovered flight data detailed a rather baffling explanation for the crash. So the question now being, just what was going on on board that plane? West Atlantic Airlines is a cargo transportation company based out of Scandinavia and the United Kingdom. The company is divided into two subsidiaries, Westair Europe and Westair Sweden. It is the Swedish branch that is of interest to us today. Westair Sweden operates with multiple hubs, with one of those actually being located at Oslo's Gardermoen Airport in Norway. As a cargo airline, the company flies a variety of different aircraft with a mixed fleet of turboprop and jet planes. Making up just a small portion of their jet fleet, the airline operates the Canadian-built Bombardier CRJ-200. The CRJ-200 is part of the wider range of regional jets offered by Bombardier. The 200 model was incredibly successful. Around the world, over 1,000 of the planes were built. The plane was so well-liked that cargo airlines also found it to be useful as a freighter aircraft. The Axton plane was built in 1993. Delivered to West Air Sweden, it made over 31,000 flights by the time of the accident. That accident flight in question originated from Oslo in the evening of January 7, 2016. Just two pilots would be on board the aircraft and would be carrying mail to Tromsø in northern Norway. The names of the pilots were withheld from the public in the investigation, but what we do know is that the captain was a 42-year-old man from Spain. He had accumulated nearly 3,400 flight hours, 2,200 of those in the CRJ. His co-pilot was a 33-year-old man from France. The first officer had flight experience of around 3,200 flight hours, with around 1,000 logged in this plane. Leaving Oslo at just after 11pm, the pilots climbed the plane up to 33,000 feet for the nearly two-hour flight to Tromsø. The north northeasterly flight plan put them in communication with Swedish air traffic control. Easter beam of the Norwegian city of Bodo, the flight had been unremarkable up till then. The pilots, as they continued north, would soon begin looking into their approach into Tromsø. During the approach briefing, the captain's side attitude direction indicator began showing an erroneous interpretation of pitch, startling the captain. The attitude direction indicator is one of the most recognizable cockpit instruments that gives a pilot an indication of pitch and roll. It's connected to a component called an inertial reference unit, or IRU for short. There are multiple of these systems on all commercial planes usually two different units for the two main pilot displays and perhaps one or even multiple auxiliary units for backup indication. The inertial reference units feed pitching and rolling data to the displays with the help of gyroscopes. It is believed that the captain's side IRU had failed and sent faulty pitching information to the captain's display, leading to what seemed like a pitching up of the nose. Occasionally, these faults will occur, which is why pilots have the option to change the source unit for their displays. If their systems are faulty, they can swap out the faulty source with a working one. In this case, apparently, the data was inconclusive as to why the fault occurred. The captain was caught off guard. To him in that moment, he watched as the nose of the plane began pitching up. In actuality, it wasn't and the plane was flying level. The captain instinctively pushed forward on his control column, pitching the nose of the plane down for real. He didn't know that his inertial reference unit had failed, and the attitude information was corrupt. Meanwhile, on the co-pilot side, his instrument appeared to be functioning normally, and so he himself was especially confused by the actions of his captain. 
To answer an obvious and completely valid question one may have, that being how could the captain not know his plane was not pitching up, Flight 294 was flying at nighttime during the winter. It is easy to forget as we live on the ground, either in cities or in other lit up areas, even in developing countries, that at nighttime we are on the dark side of the planet. Though pilots at nighttime can use ground lighting as a reference, outside of these areas, say over an ocean or over a remote, uninhabitable mountainous region where no one lives, the view outside of a plane is total darkness. There is no distinguishing anything outside. You may not even see cloud. Depending on the location and time of year, this effect can have some variance. Flight 294 was roughly 67 degrees north. During the summer months, even at night, there could still have been some sort of light. In fact, in Tromso, the sun never sets for two months of the year in the summer. In January though, outside is complete darkness. There is no discerning between sky and land, so the pilot's view at this time may have looked something like this. Cockpit lighting was also noted by investigators. When the lights were turned on, glare against the windshield may have made any visual cues outside that may have already been difficult to see, even harder to distinguish. Pilots flying under instrument flight rules, like the two on board Flight 294, they would have relied on their cockpit instruments to tell them all the relevant information. The captain pushed the control wheel forward, initiating a nosedive, when he thought he was correcting a sudden climb. The faulting attitude indicator continued to show a pitching up motion, so the captain kept pushing forward on his control wheel. The instrument itself was also telling the captain to push down, indicated by the red arrows that would have lit up on the display. The plane began picking up speed, and the pilots began rolling the plane. They would not recover from this dive. A mayday call would go out, However, the message contained just the words Mayday repeated, with no information regarding their situation. The pilots, confused, are speeding towards the ground in a nose-down position. When in an extreme aerodynamic position, the CRJ, like other planes, will remove what the developers deem to be some unnecessary information from the digital displays to declutter them. A pitch incongruence notification was among the pieces of information removed from the pilot's displays. What investigators would pick up on would be the lack of communication between the two members of crew. Very little is spoken on the cockpit voice recording transcript. What was heard on the recording was that neither of the two pilots understood the created situation. One of the displays was showing one thing and the other was showing something completely different. They never cross-checked their instruments against the other or with the auxiliary attitude indicator. The pilots did attempt to recover the plane from the dive. Because the pilots were getting conflicting information from their differing attitude displays, it would seem the suggestions from each other would make no sense as it contradicted their instrument, though the first officer's was correct. During the following minute, the entirety of the plane's altitude was drained, as the vertical speed even nearly surpassed the speed of sound. The pilots were fighting extreme gravitational forces. The plane was inverted, upside down, headed in an easterly direction. At 20 minutes past midnight, the date having gone into January 8th, West Air Sweden Flight 294 soon crashed into the ground at high speed, in a vertical nose-down position. The plane hit the ground intact, to the intrigue of some investigators who may have expected an in-flight breakup from the plane overspeeding excessively. The aircraft was completely obliterated, leaving a crater behind. The two pilots were killed. When the investigators rounded up their investigation, they could not determine why the inertial reference unit on the captain's side failed like it did. It was highlighted that the crew mismanaged the plane in the scenario of a failure of a redundant system. Instruments are duplicated on the flight deck of airplanes for the very reason that transpired that night. If an abnormality occurs unexpectedly, instruments should be cross-checked and the source IRU and therefore the source gyro should be changed. 
The accident was put down as a loss of control, induced by pilot spatial disorientation. Following the accident, it was recommended that airplane manufacturers review their primary flight displays so that critical information is not withdrawn from a pilot where it may be relevant. Hello everyone, thank you so much for watching this week's video. If you found it to be interesting, be sure to be subscribed as there is always a new video every Saturday. I may actually be moving soon myself. I will let you know if this will affect the upload schedule, but I will try to keep videos coming during that time. Thank you once again to everyone who has subscribed to the channel in recent times. It still has not sunk in that the channel has hit 100,000 subscribers. Disaster Breakdown is now verified actually, something I never thought I would see, but here we are. Anyway, it's time to take a moment to thank my patrons over on Patreon for continuing to support the channel. Their names are scrolling on the screen right now, so if you see your name here, a massive thanks to you. If you yourself want to support the channel further, consider joining the Disaster Breakdown Patreon from just one pound per month, and the link to that will be in the pinned comment below. All patrons get early access to all new content, 48 hours before it goes out publicly on YouTube. If you want to follow my personal Twitter page, that will be linked in this video's description. But with all that said, I think that's where I'll sign off on this video. Thank you so much for watching, and I will see you all next week. Goodbye!